Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnston. Welcome to lecture 43 of Introductory Linear Algebra. In today's class, we're going to take this idea of using diagonalization to compute large powers of a matrix one step farther. What we've done up until now is we've been always considering large integer powers of a matrix. Like we know how to compute the zeroth power of a matrix and the first and the second and the third, but it's always been a whole number power of a matrix. Okay, and the way we computed this via diagonalization was, you know, we would first diagonalize that matrix, right? And then we would compute the large power of the diagonal piece in the middle. We would compute d to the power n, okay? And then we would sort of undiagonalize in a sense. We would multiply back together that diagonalization. We would take d to the power n and multiply it on the left and right by p and p inverse. And that would give us a to the power n. Okay, but really, this procedure, it doesn't require n to be an integer. Okay, we could do this exact same thing with n being a half, or the square root of 2, or pi, or a negative number. It doesn't matter. All of these things work because this matrix D, it's diagonal, and you just do things to that diagonal piece. Okay, and this is sort of a general theme. If you want to do something to a matrix, well, just diagonalize it and do that thing to the diagonal entries in the diagonal piece in the middle. All right, so let's let's see how this works if we wanted to, say, find a square root of a matrix, okay? Well, first off, what does it mean to find a square root of a matrix? Well, it means find me a matrix that squares to the original matrix that I'm talking about, okay? So if, if I started off with a matrix A and I said, hey, find me a square root B of A. Well, that means find a matrix B with the property that b squared equals a, okay? Because then b is a square root of a. Okay, we know how to do this if a and b are numbers, but for matrices, this is way outside the scope of anything that we've talked about, right? Like, this seems very hard. If you just wrote out explicitly, like, the equations that you're trying to solve here, like, you're trying, like, you could write b in terms of its entries, just give names to even each of its entries, multiply them together, set equal to a. It's going to be a horrendous system. It's not a linear system, right? You're, you're going to have variables multiplying by variables. It's like a quadratic system. It's atrocious to solve. Do not try to find a square root b directly from the definition of matrix multiplication. You'll go crazy, okay? Fortunately, though, diagonalization to the rescue, okay? Because what you can do is you can do this exact procedure that we've been doing for, for this la these last few videos, okay? You diagonalize the matrix A that you started off with, okay? And just square root the diagonal piece, okay? Just compute square root of D in the middle, where the way you compute it is you just do the square root of each of the diagonal entries, Okay, so you just compute square root of D, the diagonal piece, entry-wise, and then you undiagonalize, multiply again by P and P inverse on the left and right. Okay, and I claim that gives you a square root of the original matrix A. Okay, and the reason for that, to convince ourselves that, yes, this matrix B really is the square root of A, well, we just got to multiply B by itself and see what happens. We just got to compute B squared. Okay, and what happens is, well, you get P root D, P inverse, times itself. Okay, and then the same magic thing happens in the middle here as when you compute large powers. That P inverse and P in the middle, those cancel with each other and just give you an identity matrix. And then what are you left with? P on the left, P inverse on the right, and then root D times root D. And because D is diagonal, you just multiply them entry-wise, you're just taking square roots of numbers and multiplying them by each other all along that diagonal there. So root D times root D is just D. Okay, as the notation suggests, and PDP inverse, well, that's just A, right? Because that's just a diagonalization of A that we started with. Okay, so yeah, B really is a square root of A if you just square root the diagonal piece in the middle of a diagonalization. So let's go through an example and see how this works, okay? Let's compute a square root of this matrix A equals 0, 4, minus 1, 5. All right, so there's a lot of work that goes into this. Like, it's not really quick and straightforward, but it is just sort of a mechanical process, okay? We've seen all the steps that we have to do laid out. We just follow those steps. So we know we're going to need a diagonalization. How do you get a diagonalization? Well, you compute eigenvalues and eigenvectors first, all right? So compute eigenjunk, okay? Eigenvalues to start. You set determinant of A minus lambda I equal to zero. Subtract lambda off the diagonal of A. That's what we're doing there. Use your two by two formula for the determinant of a matrix, of a two by two matrix. Expand that out. Now you've got a quadratic equation here. And then, hey, that quadratic equation factors. It factors as lambda minus one times lambda minus four. So what are my eigenvalues? Well, they're just lambda equals one and lambda equals four. All right, so great. I've got my eigenvalues now. Eigenvalues of that matrix are one and four. Cool beans. 
what do we do next? Next, you compute the eigenvectors corresponding to those two eigenvalues. So starting off, I mean, remember you work one at a time, one eigenvalue at a time. Let's start off with lambda equals one, find the corresponding eigenvectors. How do you do this? Well, you take your matrix A, subtract lambda off the diagonal. So here I'm working with lambda equals one, subtract one off the diagonal, okay? And when you do that, you get this matrix here, minus one, four, minus one, four, augment with zeros on the right-hand side. That's always the linear system that you solve for finding eigenvectors, right? Subtract lambda off the diagonal, augment with zeros. All right, now just solve that, okay? And I mean, it's two by two and it's fairly straightforward. This is a really nice linear system actually. Okay, just do row two minus row one. Hey, now we can see this is in row echelon form. I've got my leading entry here, my free variable over here. Okay, so V1 is leading, V2 is free. Okay, so write your leading entry in terms of the free entry or leading variable in terms of free variables. That top row there, that corresponds to the equation minus V1 plus four V2 equals zero. Bring your free variables over to the other side and solve for leading in terms of free. So V1 equals four V2, okay? And now throw it into a vector, okay? V, well, by definition, V is just V1, V2, but what is V1? Well, it's four V2, okay? So I can replace that first entry, replace all of your leading entries by expressions in terms of free variables. Okay, and then when you do that, factor out those free variables. Here I've got a V2 in each entry. So this vector here is just V2 times four, one. Okay, so what that tells me is that every eigenvector corresponding to lambda equals one is a multiple of four, one. Okay, in other words, four, one is a basis of that one dimensional eigenspace. All right, so that's the eigenvector that I'm gonna use in my diagonalization in a minute. Okay, do the same thing with lambda equals four. Now we're subtracting four off of the diagonal instead of just one off of the diagonal, still augmenting with zeros. And you just do row operations to get into row echelon form now. Fortunately, we only had to do one row operation. And again, V1 is leading, V2 is free. That top equation, it corresponds to minus four V1 plus four V2 equals zero. Rearrange that so that it's leading variable in terms of free variables. Okay, so in this case, after you rearrange that, you're just gonna find that, hey, V1 equals V2, okay? And now write down what your eigenvector is. Well, your eigenvector is V1, V2, except V1 equals V2, okay? So I can replace this leading variable via that free variable. I can replace the V1 by a V2. Okay, so now V2, V2, well, I'll just pull the V2 out. I'm left with scalar multiple times one, one, okay? So all of my eigenvectors are multiples of this guy here, one, one. All right, so again, it's a one-dimensional eigenspace with one, one as a basis, okay? So that's the eigenvector that I'm gonna use in my diagonalization in a second. I've got all my eigenjunk now. I've got my eigenvalues, eigenvectors. Next step, diagonalize that matrix. So first off, I do know that this matrix is diagonalizable because its eigenvalues are distinct, right? It's a two by two matrix with two distinct eigenvalues, one and four. Or alternatively, right, I compute its eigenvectors. And if I throw four, one and one, one into a set, well, that's a linearly independent set of two eigenvectors. So yes, it's diagonalizable. How do I construct that diagonalization? Well, I need to construct P, D, and P inverse, okay? And the way I do that, well, D, I throw the eigenvalues down the diagonal. So I throw one and four down the diagonal in whichever order I like. So I'm just gonna do one and then four, okay? And then P, you construct that by sticking the corresponding eigenvectors in, in the same order, okay? So the eigenvector corresponding to one well, that was four one, okay? And the eigenvector corresponding to lambda equals four was one one. So that's the order I stick them in. That gives me my matrix P. Last up, I need P inverse. And to do that, I mean, I just invert P however I like. I can use gauche Jordan elimination, or I can use the explicit formula for the inverse of a two by two matrix, okay? Either way, I get one third times this guy over here, and then I'm done. That's my diagonalization, okay? Next up, great, that gives me a diagonalization of A. I wanna construct B, the square root, from it, okay? And remember the way I said I was gonna do that was I was gonna take this diagonal matrix and I was just gonna square root its diagonal entries like entry-wise, okay? So I'm gonna square root the first diagonal entry one and I'm gonna square root the next diagonal entry four and when I do that, I'm just gonna get one and two on the diagonal, okay? So that's gonna be the diagonal piece in the diagonalization of the square root matrix. Okay, next up, I sort of undiagonalize, right? Now I keep P and P inverse the same, but I use the square rooted D in the middle instead. So now I compute P times root D times P inverse, and that gives me my square root matrix that I'm calling B here. 
All right, so now I just sub in all of these matrices that I've computed, okay? What is P? Well, we had that up above, it was 4111. What is root D? It's 1002, and I just have that there. And then over here, this is P inverse, except I pulled the one third out in front. Again, you can pull the scalars out in front, no problem there, scalars commute. Okay, and now just multiply all this junk together. You've just got to do two matrix multiplications and you get your answer, okay? And as usual, I like doing the rightmost multiplication first. So I'm just gonna carry along this one third, four, one, one, one. Uh, I'll carry that along for the ride. Here I did this rightmost matrix multiplication. I got one minus one minus two, eight. And now I do the next matrix multiplication. And what do I get? I get one third times the matrix two, four, minus one, seven. Okay, and that is the square root of the original matrix A that I started with. Okay, in other words, this is a matrix with a property that if I square this, I get A. Okay, maybe to really convince ourselves of that, right, this is our first square root computation. Let's go through, let's verify that, yeah, that's actually true. Okay, let's double check our work. Okay, so let's compute B squared just to make sure that we really do get A here. Okay, so here's that matrix B that I just computed, and I'm multiplying it by itself. And when I do that, well, I've got a one-third times a one-third gives me a one-ninth. And now I just do my matrix multiplication rule, and I get this ugly junk. And I simplify a little bit, and then wouldn't you know it, each of these entries ends up being a multiple of nine. Cancels out with the nine in the denominator there, and I get exactly zero, four, minus one, five. Which, yeah, that's the matrix A that we started with. Okay, so this really is a square root of that matrix A. Okay, and maybe it's worth noting that this is not the only square root of the matrix A, okay, because I actually had a little bit of freedom here. It turns out there are four square roots of A, okay? I computed one of them, and the way that you could get the other square roots, there are three others, is throw different combinations of plus and minus signs along the diagonal here, where, here when you square, compute the square root of the diagonal piece, right? The, there's not only one square root of one, we could have picked one, but we could have also picked minus one. And same thing down here, there's two square roots of four. We could have picked two, like we did, or we could have picked minus two. And you can mix and match freely on, along the diagonal here. And depending on which choices you'll make, you get different resulting matrices from this undiagonalization step. So there are actually four square roots corresponding to the four different combinations of plus and minuses that you can pick there. Just like there are two square roots of any positive real number. Okay, well, as the size of your matrix increases, you get more and more distinct square roots. All right, so in this previous example, when we were taking a square root of a matrix, we were basically taking the power one half of a matrix. Okay, but there's no reason that you have to use just integers or one half. You can use any power. This exact same procedure still works. Okay, so now we're gonna define matrix powers for other exponents, other non-integer exponents. So let R be any real number, okay, and A be any diagonalizable matrix, okay? So you can write A as PDP inverse for some invertible P and diagonal D, okay? It's diagonalizable. Then we define a to the power r to be p d to the power r p inverse, okay? Where d to the power r, the way you compute it is you just raise each of those diagonal entries to the power r, okay? So you just do, you know, real number exponentiation along the diagonal, which we already know how to do, okay? And this is an okay definition because it coincides with our already existing definition of matrix powers when r happens to be a positive integer, okay? Nothing changes. Okay, so let's compute, say, a to the power pi, when a is that same matrix from this previous example that we just computed the square root of. Let's compute this weird non-integer power of this matrix. Okay, so again, you've got to start off with your eigenjunk, but fortunately, we already know our eigenjunk, and even more so, we know our diagonalization. So I'm just going to copy and paste our diagonalization from the previous example. D was 1004, okay, P was 4111, and P inverse was that guy there. Okay, so we already have our diagonalization. So all we've got to do is we've got to raise d to the power pi, right? Whatever power we're interested in, okay? And then we multiply it back together with p and p inverse. Okay, so a to the power pi is p d to the power pi times p inverse. I just sub those in, okay? So over here, this is p. This is p inverse, except I pulled the one third out in front because scalars commute with everything. And then in here, this, that's d to the power pi, right? I just did one to the power pi in the top left which is just one, one to any exponent is just one, and then four to the power pi in the bottom right. And now I just need to multiply all that junk together, okay? And I'm gonna start with the rightmost matrix multiplication, leave the left junk alone just for now. After I do that right matrix multiplication, I get this matrix here. And now I do the next matrix multiplication. And after I do that, I get this lovely matrix here. And that is a to the power pi.
okay? One thing that's worth thinking about in this definition of, you know, weird matrix powers, what happens if you plug r equals negative 1 into this definition, right? Into this definition up here. What happens if you sub in r equals minus 1? So you do p times d inverse times p inverse, okay? And I mean, maybe I should say d to the power of minus 1 in the middle there. What you're doing is you're doing 1 divided by each of those diagonal entries. In other words, 1 divided by each of the eigenvalues of that matrix. And it turns out when you do that, you get exactly the inverse of the matrix. In other words, a to the power minus one computed via this formula here really is the inverse of the matrix, okay? You do get a inverse, okay? So this is sort of a way of justifying the notation that we've been using for the past five or six weeks, okay? a to the power minus one really is a inverse. So it makes sense to use sort of exponential notation like this for the inverse of a matrix. Alrighty, so that'll do it for weird matrix powers. Next class, we're going to take this one step farther and show that actually you can do other weird functions to a matrix as well. Like, for example, you can do E to the power of a matrix, or you can compute a logarithm of a matrix, or sine of a matrix, and so on. So I'll see you next class for that.